Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. That is right. Welcome to Science Faction 25, Science Faction Revenge. <laughs> I am Robert Timothy, your host, who is both a full-time archaeologist, part-time stand-up comedian, and all-time science educator. And with me is our real scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing? I'm good. Just doing all that real science. Super it's science-y. Tough. It's it's tough. Emanating mm-hmm. from your pores. You know what you're talking about. Yeah. And, of course, oh, the, o- the other person who's... <laughs> Making noise that doesn't always make sense. Damien Mercado, our full-time comedian. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, great, uh, but I'd like to be referred to as Captain Science from now on. Doctor Cap- Captain Science. Captain, Do- Doctor Captain. Doctor Captain Science. Well, first of all, you have no PhD or MD. Second of all, you never attain the rank of Captain in the Armed Forces. He did so- show up wearing scrubs, though. Well, That's I mean, Captain true. America I'd never... I mean, he- No, he did, actually. He okay, was a Captain. fair enough. That was uh, Captain <laughs> Planet. Horrible, horrible. Captain Planet didn't. <laughs> no, Captain Planet was uh, actually yeah, in the reserves. Did. Captain yeah, Crunch? That's right. <laughs> Cap- oh, Captain oh. Crunch is Captain. Yeah, Cap- no, Cap- not actually Captain. Captain Crunch had a commission in the Navy. He was a long time. He was an Annapolis man. He sure. has like oh. a whole Wikipedia history. Thing. I don't trust a guy who's that old and couldn't make Admiral. Stuck at Captain. <laughs> That's right. That guy had a long career. He went rogue. Also, Captain Planet. Like, are you saying that like one weekend a month, two yeah. weeks a year, all the kids put their rings together and like create Captain Planet just so he could serve his his duty as a national guardsman? That's right, and he There's... was really poorly used too. Oh, they God. never even used any of his special powers. He was just like delivering Humvees back and forth from two different army bases. That would imply that your average person did something. It's mainly just an excuse to get drunk with yeah. in a in a in a shitty part of whatever state you're from. Uh, for those of countries who don't have military reserves, I would explain it to you, but Damien just gave the best definition I've ever heard. Uh, that's exactly what it is. You are here Captain with Science Faction, apparently a very subversive program. Uh, we're now being banned by Facebook. Uh, banned? Our, well, our ads are. Um, apparently our, our science awareness campaign, Science is Badass, which you may see with some of our clever graphics it was flagged by facebook they've been they've been allowing us to promote posts for for a few months but now they've decided that the term badass is incredibly offensive so for all of you out there i'm very sorry for apparently destroying your moral value and the very fabric in which the society you live is based on by you using the bitch. term badass i know how dare you i know and uh for such a nefarious cause as well but indeed science is badass and we're going to continue to fight the man so I want you to go and uh, like our Facebook page again, if you haven't done it already, and uh, keep listening because the man doesn't want you to, and what the right. man really doesn't want you to know about is scientific articles. Woo! From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, we got some interesting articles coming out today, guys. You guys excited about some good science this week? Obviously, yeah. it's badass. <laughs> Wait, hey, hey, now we're going to have to ban this episode. <laughs> From Facebook? You can't just keep saying things are badass. Clearly, we're going to tear the fabric of society like apart. badass is allowed on television. How is it not allowed on Facebook? As, as the person who designed those posters, who designed those images, I'm really... What is so offensive about a super buff Einstein holding a gun? Yeah. What it was that? Was that... Did that defend anybody? Uh, I yeah. just know that it was badass. You know what's not badass? Cancer. Agreed. And it turns out... That, uh, uh, I think it depends who you ask. Yeah, they ask the husband of a really bitchy person who gets cancer. He might be pretty down. <laughs> Cancer's had opportunities to prove itself. Cancer yeah. could have killed Hitler. <laughs> cancer could have done a lot of things. That's true. <laughs> Did not live up to the hype, Cancer. Fair enough. But Cancer has been around with us for a long time, and there's this idea that's kind of in New Agey circles that cancer is a modern disease, and we've known for a long time that's not true. We have archaeological yeah. evidence of cancer and skeletons that are thousands of years old. We know that it exists for a long time. Also, one of the myths is that it doesn't happen to certain animals, doesn't happen to sharks. Trust me, sharks get cancer. Every animal gets cancer. And what we're finding now and what recent research has just shown that was published out this week is that cancer actually affects some of the most basic creatures on Earth. Now, are those only the species that can eat GMOs? 
That's right. <laughs> the GMO related species. Right. Okay, yeah. I thought it was only the species that have ingested or was exposed to the GMOs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually not true. Either. In this case, they were doing <laughs> hydro, which is kind of like a type of coral, so a very basic animal. And they found in two different species, they found instances of cancer in it. Both of these happened to be cancer that affected what would essentially be the female reproduction system mm -hmm. it, or the analogous system in the coral to our own. So uh, we know that female reproduction systems do tend to get ovarian cancer yep. and uterine cancer and stuff here. So again, another another kind of synonym that we have in the, the animal world. Basically what happens in this case is germ cells, so the, the cells that they're going to be using to reproduce, grow out of control, they become cancerous cysts, and they have the same issues that we would have. Depression. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> STDs. Late mortgage payment. Same, same exact. That's what cancer causes. Late Emotionally mortgage. unavailable father. <laughs> um, can't, bitchy I'm, facebook moderators i wish cancer upon you is that what you're saying <laughs> no, no i'm just saying cancer also sometimes has to deal with the intricacies of the term badass and censorship that could be i'm going to try to steer this episode towards all of us agreeing at some point uh us marching down to mark zuckerberg's house and beating the crap out of him That's unless right. you reverses this decision <laughs> oh, yeah, we're gonna get real far with that listen mark here's how it works <laughs> damien and i are real lazy so you're taking jackie and some grappling <laughs> He's pretty skinny. I could take it. Yeah, all right. Fair <laughs> enough. The idea of cancer being modern is obviously this false. This is ridiculous. Yeah, me. yeah. No, but what we can say is there are certain elements of life, modern life, that are going to make you more susceptible to certain types of cancer, you know? Yeah, aging. I yeah. mean, people are like, oh, we didn't have cancer thousands of years ago. Oh, we also died at 30. Yeah, statistically, like, you didn't have it. You know, there's an old saying that, that sooner or later, everybody gets cancer. It just exactly. depends on how long a time scale you wait. Yeah. There are certain elements of modern life that are going to be more likely to give you cancer if you're exposed sure. to radioactive materials, if you're exposed to asbestos. Uh, at the same time, staying out of the sun like we tend to do in modern life probably prevents a lot of skin cancers so mm -hmm. you know give or take by yeah. the way i'm picturing like a doctor in a horror movie type setting turning around saying you know as a warning to the kids at the beginning of the movie sooner or later <laughs> everyone gets cancer <laughs> also i named my penis cancer <laughs> oh god there's the turn there's the turn that's like the sixth sense ending <laughs> i'm legally not allowed to be talking to you without a parent present <laughs> His penis was a ghost the whole time. <laughs> okay, so now that we've figured out that even the most basic forms of life get cancer, very interesting news, though probably not necessarily surprising to anybody who had followed that field. Right. A couple of questions for my panel. Number one, given that the BS about cancer being the result of modern life is being disproven weekly more and more, what's the next BS New Age claim we're going to hear from quacks like Dr. Oz and Deepak Chopra? First of all, I think Dr. Oz is the worst, just the worst. I think he was probably a fine cardiologist, which is what he is. Mm -hmm. I just can't, I can't tell you how much I hear from people. Well, Dr. Oz said this, Dr. Oz yeah. said that. I hate that he's like this holy grail of doctors that like everything he says is gospel. No, and, and what's sad is he is so wrong about most of what he did. He actually got taken to Congress yeah, a week and a half ago. Yeah, he defend himself to the Senate. Because, like, because of his incredibly irresponsible... Irresponsible is exactly Just what ridiculous. Say. Almost, He's running a gossip column that he's disguising yes. as medical information. And yes. for anybody who hasn't heard of him or hasn't researched him, he is probably the most prominent quack that there is around. He was taken to task in Congress by Senator McCaskill who is a famous climate science denier. There's video of Nye schooling her yeah. on the internet recently. Yeah. And even she was like, even your she... science is yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the ultimate insult. Yeah, so in general, if you hear Dr. Oz say something, you can probably assume, do the opposite. Like, he, <laughs> he should be reverse medical knowledge. What if he's your cardiologist? Get a better cardiologist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling he does probably is not a practicing cardiologist anymore because he's got he's spending too much time yeah, hanging um, out with Oprah, freaking out forty five year old women. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, your question was, what's the next thing that he'll claim? Yeah, what's the next thing that these kind of wacko new age guys are going to claim is doing? Mm -hmm. I think he once claimed that uh, apple juice is giving you arsenic poisoning or something. Oh uh, yeah, that was all part of his alkaline yeah. pH oh, body gosh. system BS. The next thing Dr. Oz will tell you is that water is actually toxic. Water. Yeah, water is what's killing us. I mean, uh -huh. if you think about it, I can almost assure you that everybody you know who's ever died has recently drunk water. 
Exactly. Or has it somewhere in their system? Yeah. Somewhere like, within their body. They're... Yeah. Like maybe 70 to 80% of yeah. them is no, this Certainly thing. above 10. Yeah. I'll give you that. Definitely. I mean, if you we look know how long at... how they've been dead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> look at the percentage of water in a dead body, right? Right. And somebody who just died, look at the percentage of... You think that's just a coincidence? No. Probably not. No. Probably not. Every time, every person, Damien, I don't think 100% of cases are a coincidence. Yeah. You're right. You win this round. <laughs> Damien, what do you think the next claim that Dr. Oz is going to make about cancer? There's going to be some new uh, unfounded creature that doesn't get cancer. Let's say it's the Shetland pony. Shetland okay. ponies don't get cancer. <laughs> okay. Right? Well, it's going to be something like Shetland pony semen enema once a week. We'll the keep the semen. cancer away. <laughs> you take the semen from a Shetland pony. Well, you harvest it. Yeah, and then you, you, have, you give yourself an enema with it. It's like one of those ones where they're cycling 60 gallons of water through you. I feel like you're just Got trying it. to justify like some, of your, <laughs> some of your outside Shetland pony practices. Listen, I have What a you machine. call the quote-unquote quick enema. I have a machine I'm looking to sell to New Age Practice. I'm already promoting this. a Shetland pony penis? Because that's what it sounds like the well, machine is. Well, it's just a Shetland pony in the back of his yeah, car. that's right. <laughs> I've been harvesting for a while, all right? But I got the machine. I'll sell the machine. Damien keeps promoting what he calls the all-natural enema method. <laughs> it just puts it right up there himself. Thanks for pretending that uh, when I said Shetland pony and I pretended that it was, you know, just some random creature. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. not calling me on that, allowing me to develop this. Well, that's the only yeah. horse you can carry in the trunk of your car. Okay, on to question <laughs> number two. If cancer is a lifelong partner of life, is eradicating cancer a genocide of life's oldest pal? Yeah, it's sort of like Magneto and Professor X. Yeah. They're sort of, I mean, they're besties. But then they also have to be enemies sometimes because they just don't always agree about who they kill. Yeah, and you know they not kill. and they wouldn't kill one another, right? Like they right. would fight. They yeah. would fight to stop each other, but they're not. If if one has a gun on the other, he's not going to pull the trigger. Yeah, and especially you don't really with Professor have... X, because that would be pointless as Magneto could stop the bullet. Absolutely, he is crazy. The world would be so much. This is an enemy that we can finally be rid of once and for all. Like but it's, it's, it's not like an war. Enemy. It's a natural phenomenon. That's so is incest, why. but we've stomped that out. <laughs> like, Have we? Ha, yeah, yeah. Well, not my house. Yeah. <laughs> Damn government trying to tell me who I can't fuck in my own house. Just because you're half related to that pony? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, I always thought that cancer was like oddly Shakespearean because a lot of its ability to kill you comes from your own ability to heal wounds. You know, if you get cut or something, exactly. your body replicates cells to try and fill that damage as your body naturally kills cells. It tries to replicate to fill that damage. Part of that filling that damage, if it goes out of control, is cancer. It's uncontrollable growth mm -hmm. of your own cells. This isn't a disease. It's not a something from the outside. This is right, your body fighting yourself that's why it's like oddly weird it's that's ironic why it's, that's why it's so hard to target that's why people always say you know when are you going to find a cure for cancer and it's like I, you don't you have to understand that cancer is totally natural yeah. and especially in cells that are rapidly reproducing like your stomach lining for example yep. we're not saying it's easy clearly it's a very difficult task <laughs> but we'd like it to be done I mean, unless also... you can target cancer to only attack certain people then ooh, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, like biological warfare, yeah. but only for jerks. This... Sleep with one eye open, Damien. Oh, for sure. I, I, I I'm got a new lease on life. I, I'm. I'd be really surprised if I was on uh, Cancer Santa's naughty list. I mean, come on. I'm. I bring joy <laughs> to millions. What's in Cancer Santa's bag? Because it just. It's, yeah. yeah, it's just asbestos Plutonium. and radium. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a bunch of UV light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like the idea of Cancer Santa. By the way, yeah, me too. <laughs> All the bad kids. Yeah. yeah. He's, no he, more coal. Yeah. <laughs> Just cancer in your stomach. I left a lump of cancer in your throat. <laughs> what was the... It's like the old German. There was a, a Santa used to have a. Um... He like follows Santa. Like they're two. They're a duo. Yeah, he looks like a, he looks like Satan. He looks like Satan. Yeah. But so basically, let me get this right. Alien suit fell from the sky. It got on Santa. Santa used that because it could form into any suit he wanted. He went out and he performed Christmas acts for Krampus. a few years. But then after yes. a, and after a few years of doing so. This, he felt that the suit was beginning to control him, so he got rid of the suit, and the suit then encountered this other guy, Krampus, who was like an angry bodybuilder, and that, that morphed around. previously been spited by Santa. Yeah, and when it morphed around to him, it gave him all of Santa's powers. This is much better. I like this, this storyline. Yeah, it's not I'd like at to see all this what it is, but it's way better. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see this written to Stan Lee, get on it. Yeah, okay. This is our original idea. I like how our comic book references are becoming more obscure. Yeah. Question number three. So like I just said, and we, we, we started commenting on, cancer is the body's own ability to heal itself, turned against itself. Or just, or just be, I mean, or just, or just yeah, keep going. Or just replicate. Yeah. 
what is going to be the body's next thing that backfires? What is the next natural body process that's going to turn out to hurt us in the end? There are other examples of that that exist now, like cystic fibrosis, where you have uncontrollable mucus production and eventually drowns you in your lungs. Listen, all sympathies out there to anybody who has cystic fibrosis, horrible disease. Yeah. But how nerdy is that disease? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, I'm so <laughs> verklempt, I can't get anything out. Yeah, yeah. There is there is that year or so where yeah. it's just a lot of hacking. I, that, that was especially racist because I'm pretty sure cystic fibrosis disproportionately affects Jews. So sorry about <laughs> yeah, that. Absolutely, guys. it does. It, it yeah. also disproportionately affects children. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the it's one of the old world like like Nerdy Jewish children. <laughs> learning class is one of those old world uh, Jewish things that you know you could taste the skin to, of a cystic, and it's true because they actually do have much saltier sweat. Right. And for whatever reason, and so like they, you could actually taste a cyst- kid with cystic fibrosis until. <laughs> wow! So we should really be so training. This is, this is why you're looking children. Yeah, we should be training. Yeah, that's why I'm looking children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'll tell the judge. Yeah, okay. that, and I'm doing the air quotes right now. That's why. <laughs> we should be training pedophiles to be able to taste cystic fibrosis because yeah. who else tastes children more yeah. than pedophiles? Why not use the resources at that's hand? Right. So you're meaning like domesticate the pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We can use. We can leave him in his wild environment. We just give him some training beforehand. We Do, get, like, a shot should collar. we leave him in his wild environment? <laughs> I don't see why not. Granted, cystic fibrosis is a very small percentage of the population. Uh-huh. But if we molested a hundred percent of kids and had the well-trained molesters, we would know every cystic fibrosis case early and be able to stop it. When they came to, I don't molest- think you can actually really, you stop it. You don't- <laughs> You don't see it all. Why not? When it's they like ca- a screening procedure. I don't. I don't know. When they sent men, it's like that time to- I decided that we should teach rapists how to identify breast cancer. <laughs> when they came to molest my neighbor's kids, I said nothing. <laughs> when they came to molest my kid, it was too late. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next story, which is all about the Ebola virus. Remember, like, Ebola from the 90s? It was kind of a big deal back then. That's Without right. the Ebola virus, Dustin Hoffman wouldn't have had his, the closest thing he's had to an action star role. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> so uh, Ebola, we first encountered about 30 years ago. Apparently, it came from bats. It's a really bad hemorrhagic fever that basically infects your body, causes a cascade of white blood cells, which basically burst your blood vessels from the inside, and you bleed out internally. Mm-hmm. Horrible way to die. Horrible disease, very painful, very quick acting, yeah, very contagious and very lethal. And that's been the problem with Ebola for a while. There's actually a few strains of Ebola, some in Western Africa, some in Eastern. There's been a recent outbreak, which is now the, officially the worst Ebola outbreak in history. So all the stuff you heard about the 90s ever since then, not as bad as this one outbreak. This outbreak's across the countries of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. 350 people are dead with 560 some odd infected, which means over a 50% mortality rate, which is quite high. It spreads very easily. It's hard to fight because it is viral, not bacterial, and it's a particularly quickly evolving virus, so it changes quite frequently. Even if we came up with an Ebola vaccine, which is very difficult, because of the virulent nature of it, uh, very few people are allowed to work on it because it's essentially a biological weapon. Exactly. So even if we came up with an Ebola vaccine, chances are it evolved so quickly that by the time you got the vaccine out to everybody, the virus would have evolved past it. Mm -hmm. Plus, there'd there'd always be the anti-vax crowd there. Oh, that's right. No, listen, I, I... I feel like with Ebola, Ebola's natural, autism isn't. That's right. <laughs> the, I feel like that would be one of the cases that would really hammer that down. Like nobody would be the vaccine deniers at that point. When you see people bleeding out from the eyes in front of you, and you're yeah. like, mm, "I'm going to get the shot." Yeah, I'm going to get the Ebola shot. Listen, there is nothing harder than being a parent of a child with autism. I would rather give my child Ebola. Jesus. Than- <laughs> Jesus, that's going to be the next thing. But unfortunately, like we said, even if they had an Ebola vaccine, it probably wouldn't work. And we don't have an Ebola vaccine. The disease is very, very dangerous. They're thinking that this might be the first Ebola outbreak to leave Africa just because of its widespread area of distribution, the amount of travel that's going on in that area now. 30 years ago, these areas, the the places in Sierra Leone and Guinea and Liberia, they were modern countries, so to speak, but didn't have nearly as much access to intercontinental plane travel and those kind of things. So mm-hmm. even in those few decades, that has increased greatly. Yeah. So has this particular strain's virulency and, and the fact that it sticks around so well. But, so, but doesn't it, isn't it spread by like fecal contact and body fluid exchange? Body fluid. Body fluid. Yeah. But body fluid, by the way, can be a sneeze. That's right. So, I mean, if, you, if you're sneezing out... Yeah. You... <laughs> 
So, so those loogie clubs that I go to where we just spit in each I other's mouths. I told mouth. you it was dangerous. So there is you some, wanted to be a rebel. There is sanitation issues. But here's the thing, Damien. And while, and while you might say, okay, you have Ebola. We're just not going to come in contact with you. You start viral shedding before you necessarily know you have the disease. That's right. And with incubation periods, it's very easy for somebody to come in contact with something. And let's say you don't even know. Let's say you never touch a person with Ebola. But you do come in contact with their wastewater from way mm-hmm. up river. You don't even know there's an outbreak, you know. You come in contact with their wastewater way down river you hop on an airplane on that airplane you know you cough or you sneeze or something like that that gets recirculated you could theoretically infect a 747 full of people without ever knowing you have the disease yeah or knowing that you were even near somebody who had the disease yeah so it can be terrifying it it is oh africa (laughs) also because of the nature of the disease once you get it it's very difficult to fight Mm -hmm. Um, there are some antivirals that can stop it from reproducing as quickly, but unless you get them incredibly early, it's not super effective and you kind of just have to wait it out and hope you're one of the lucky ones that survive. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions for my participants. Number one, given the pace of international travel and events like the world cup that mix everybody together, what tactics can we use to prevent the spread of Ebola? I mean, didn't AIDS teach us just to not go to Africa anymore? Like, no it, sex in Africa? Fuck no. It. AIDS taught us not to fuck French Canadian flight attendants. That's what. You know what? That's a lesson right. that I've forgotten many times, willingly. <laughs> Girl, That's you know. True. That's true. <laughs> it hurts so good. <laughs> what are we going to do, guys? How are we going to stop this from getting around the world? I mean, segregate the World Cup. Oh, oh okay. Totally. Now, are you talking Different about. Different water fountains for everybody? Are you talking about blacks and white segregation or Ebola, non Ebola segregation? <laughs> I'm talking by, by nation. Okay. Every nation yeah. is not allowed right. to. They, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're restricted to their embassy. There is a bus that takes them to the game. There's a set of the stands in the stadium that is just for mm-hmm. each country. Okay. It'll be like the UN. So yeah. you only get like two or three fans who can go. Well, that's actually, that's actually, I've been informed, and, and believe it or not, guys, uh, internationally, you might not know this, America, not huge in soccer. We don't really know a lot about soccer, yes. but I've been informed that that's actually a very strictly enforced policy in soccer games anyway. Oh, yeah? So that they don't rumble. Oh. oh that makes sense. But we got to keep them from, like, uh, out of sneezing range. That would just put up a sneeze guard okay, or something. Okay, giant yeah. sneeze guards in the stadium, so yeah, I like, like that. Sizzler. Yeah, Sizzler. That way, you know, any nation that has Ebola, they don't need to take everybody down with them. Okay. Yeah. That ship's going. What about you? Any any other ideas, Jack, in how we can stop it from getting around? I mean, I'm fine with just no soccer. Like, to get okay. rid of soccer. They're not okay. going to come over for any football games or anything. So That's true. That's true. You know, you claim to be Mexican. And yeah. then you'll say things which mm-hmm. take away any street cred you might have had with the Mexican-American community. Yeah, when yeah. you're like, hey, we should use birth control or... You know... Fuck the Pope. It's It's the beauty of me being half and half. I get to choose which half is better a lot of the time. <laughs> Okay. Which half's the scientific half? That's the Mexican side. (laughs) Which side's the fiery half? (laughs) The fiery half that argues a lot. Question number two. I feel like we always get diseases from bats. Like, bats seem to be one of the main... It's like bats and pigs always seem to give us the disease. (laughs) At least pigs give us pork, though. Like, bats seem fucking useless. Yeah, bacon is worth it. They're just little, little diseases. I think it's about time we return the favor. Do you agree that we should, here and now, on this very show, encourage all humans within our voice range that have STDs to begin catching and barebacking bats? I don't think you have to penetrate them, because, I mean, you want them to survive long enough to understand what they've done. You just got to really rub them up against your genitals vigorously. Okay. But you, ha- you would have to get, okay. some, you would have to get some, some pre-cum going to kind of get the fluids. It can't yeah. be a dry rub. Well, I mean, like, what do you have? Is, you, which, which, I mean, I could have you herpes, just, but I don't have yeah. chlamydia. Yeah, but you still want it wet. So you're just, you're just saying get, get yeah, worked up. Sure it seeps in. Then you wrap the bat around your penis, like wings around, like it's like some kind of bat penis cover now i don't know about you but it's going to be hard to really get one up around around the bat while fighting this creature that's biting my hand as it's doing this that's true which is why i think we need support from the porn industry to have women like dress up as and like you know we'll start off like batman themed porn then it gets you know then it's like furry bats okay Uh i like this idea that we're essentially using bats as penis beer koozies um, I, I think that might be an effective way to spread the STDs. Good good insight, Damien. What, yeah. what about you, Jackie? What uh, do you think we should do? I feel like bats are a scapegoat. Mm-hmm. I don't know that bats are really the problem. I think someone's going around spreading diseases to bats by fucking them. Oh, so this is already happening. So That's how the bats happening. are getting the disease. And the bats are coming back, and we're blaming the bats. And meanwhile, this French-Canadian flight attendant... <laughs> It's just yeah. happy-go-lucky fucking bat. Okay, well, that I mean, I guess that makes sense. And actually. now, and now, here you are trying to 
Yeah, I might, same... I might be Dr. Ozing this problem right now. Exactly. Do you think it might be the wolves who are behind all this? You know, because the cause they're scapegoated for everything. They just really want it. You know, hey, maybe bats are evil too. <laughs> totally. Huh? Vampires? Totally. Huh? Like a wolf PR guy. They got a new PR manager and they're like, listen, we're going to go scratch it all. Okay, we're going right to the source. I will say this. It does make me more curious of anybody who's really into caves. You know, yeah, like if you're really into caves, I'm like, mm, do you have some STDs you're giving off to bats right now? <laughs> If we're getting all these diseases from bats, do you not feel that like forcing more contact with us with bats yeah. would only exacerbate the problem? And perhaps because the only thing bats offer us a value is their shit anyway, so yeah. essentially we have to harvest their excrement, the dirtiest part of them. <laughs> yeah. No, let's go back to the original plan where we fuck them to death. Okay. And on to the next story. They got something going on in China, guys, that I think we're going to need over here real quick. For Don't those of you always. who haven't seen the article, go look up I Fucking Love Science because you'll need to see the picture. Check out the Chinese sperm extractor. First I of all, I fucking love science. Apparently, there's nothing offensive about that name or anything. No. Yeah, they, yeah. No, what they can, the hell is that? They can promote on Facebook all they want. Yeah. Science is badass. Too yeah. offensive. I fucking love science. I didn't even think of that. You're totally right. <laughs> they built an automatic sperm extractor to put in Chinese hospitals. And so a woman? They built a woman. Yeah, that's right. Well, you have to go online and see this. It's a really funny thing. It looks like a, a cylindrical white podium like you would give a speech at except the top has some controls to it hard to say because it's a podium but it has sexy kind of a podium. sexy design yeah. like it, it, they didn't make it a sterile design like it's something that's easy on the eyes yeah it's got nipples it's it like a it... sexy r2d2 it's like r2d2's girlfriend and what does it say about the culture that they made it a white woman um so if you look at the thing it, it looks like that with an adjustable like a movable fleshlight poking out the side that you can adjust the height on which, by the way, I, I did think You mean about, from five foot to five foot one? Yeah, that's right. I did think about that as I was looking at it, uh, because as a comedian, Damien, you know this, one of the first things you do every time you walk on stage is you... Make a racist joke against an Asian. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> first you insult Asians, <laughs> and then you adjust the mic stand uh, as you're coming up. And there's always this feeling that I get when I'm uh, adjusting the mic stand when I first walk up on stage of like... Okay, this was this other guy's stage. Now it's mine. This is this is the yeah. making it a my stage. Is when I adjust the mic That's stand about level. When the erection starts. Uh, I just imagine the process of moving that movable flashlight to your <laughs> proper dick height and being like and girth. Yeah, more like ooh, I really I I can't believe some. It's still warm. Like I can. Uh, uh. <laughs> Oh, this, you know, this is not my stage at this point. Like, I feel like I'm just borrowing another man's stage. Guy left his notes on right there. You can't just <laughs> yeah, take them right. off. <laughs> yeah, uh. what, what does pee joke mean in this case? Oh, this is going to be bad. It, it's, it's, it's to help facilitate with, I guess, fertility clinics or something. But I just imagined a room full of these. Yeah, kind of like, because the one thing the Chinese need is more Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> I just imagined a room full of these the same way you would have, like, a room full of treadmills at the gym and a bunch of dudes who were all... Like, they would be smart enough to face them away from each like other. Like, urinal partitions? Well, I thought it'd be essentially a reverse circle jerk. Like, they would have these all <laughs> facing outwards in a circle, so you didn't have to look at anybody else, but y'all knew you were in the same room. It's like Iraq yeah. in the army. <laughs> we all know... Nobody... It doesn't smell like poop in this bathroom, but all the stalls are taken. <laughs> So you basically just stand up next to this podium and fuck it, and, and that's that's how it works. You don't even need hands or anything. Like, the actual – the thing goes in and out of the podium. The fleshlight, so to speak, goes in and out of the podium. Uh, so you don't even have to move with your hips. You just stand there like a weird – God. Yeah, and just let it just let it work. Yeah, this machine was kind of necessary because stop. You know, if you you could sit there and just have sex with your wife, but you want to extract the semen to raise the likelihood of not having a girl and wasting your one child. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You know what? That, listen, I, I'd be happy to have a daughter. Chinese culture is apparently no, I, not as enlightened no, I, as me no. and Bobby, who loves women. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh, that's Love right. and respect women. Love and respect them. Uh, question number one. What's going on with the Chinese that they're having problems convincing men to jerk off? Because I feel like <laughs> yeah. they're ahead of us in everything, but the one thing we never have to try and convince people to do is jerk off. Like, we're a nation of master masturbators. Absolutely. They have martial arts that you just learn in elementary. You learn kung fu. Mm-hmm. In elementary school and on through high school and everything, their hands are far too deadly to place around uh, their genitals. Okay. There have been more Chinese broken penises. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Wow. 
So you think it's that they're such martial arts masters, they're going to choke out their own penis, given the chance. And they can't get porn on their phones, whereas our kids are getting fatter, their hands are getting more supple, and they have all the porn mm. they could ever want on their smartphone. Our kids are just gonna. Our kids are gonna lock themselves in the room and never come out. Yeah. By the way, I feel like that's the opposite of what the martial arts should be. They should train it so where the the guy's just looking and he's like, "Aren't you afraid of masturbating? You're gonna hurt your dick." And he just looks intently at you for four seconds and he goes, "I'm done." <gasps> Master. <Yeah. laughs> Hands free. <laughs> what that would be like a uh, like a. But pe- then he like moves the podium to the side. By the side. way, by the way, the the hands free masturbation. The only time you're legally allowed to do it while driving. <laughs> How do you know he was finished? I heard a pan flute come from somewhere yeah. in the background. <laughs> uh, same way I got pregnant. That is kind of weird to me that they're that they need it's to extremely weird. they need to convince guys to like, jerk off because I also I feel like they don't need to convince people to study. Their kids just get home and start doing math homework. Our kids just get home and start jerking off. We should have a foreign exchange program. You know, there's so many examples of that in different Asian countries where like they've taken something of luxury or or happiness and just boiled it down to your hotel room is a white box similar to a coffin that you will sleep in and do nothing else yeah. and there will be no form of relaxation or anything like this is just this is what you do in here this is it it's sterile that's all and now that's what they're doing with jerking off well in china it's kind of a space thing it's the same reason they eat cat and dog because it's calories are calories that's just <laughs> yeah. like there's a billion fucking people in this country well let's be honest see this is the way i thought of it i almost thought of this as like the medical marijuana prescription or for those of you in other countries just basically an excuse like a, a legitimate excuse for an otherwise illicit activity they're like yeah this is going to be our quote-unquote sperm extractor but then it's going to be in the corner of every bar like yeah. you've ever yeah, been in like totally. in case we need semen samples right away in fact this is just basically a replacement for the fact that Chinese have a substantial deficit of women. Yeah. So they're basically starting out making That's robotic exactly podium right. women. Exactly right. Or if we put these in American bars and we put them... Right next to the erotic photo hunt. Yeah. Right next to the erotic <laughs> photo hunt and right in... For, so if the podium's right at groin level, right at head level is one of those breathalyzers before you leave, uh, yeah. how much could we cut down on DUIs? There totally. you go. All the stigma... Totally. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, take a breathalyzer because I'm responsible. But and it, I, only wor- <laughs> it only works if you blow up uh, under a .08. And then the podium oh, will start that's working. that's just cruel. <laughs> That'll encourage you to get sober before Who you need to drive to home. jerk off sober in a bar? Either that or it's going to be a really weird situation where you're standing up next to the podium, shit face, slamming your dick into it while you try and convince your friend who's sober to blow into the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Pour some beer Listen, on the thing. It's not lit. It's not secreting the lube. I'm not saying you're blowing my dick technically. You're just blowing something that allows me to get my dick blown. <laughs> it's not gay, bro. It's not gay. It's not gay, bro. That leads to the question, since this is essentially a replacement woman. Jackie, are you threatened by a machine that's out to take your job? No, I think oh. you should be threatened what? if this ever if this ever gets out. Here's what's going to happen. The sperm extractor starts out in the model that they have. Yeah. So that's sort of how I imagine agriculture, livestock, sperm extraction originally started. I'll tell you where it is now and where it's going. Have you ever seen <laughs> the apparatus they use to extract bull semen? It no. is an enormous dildo, enormous. Uh-huh. That is keep going. That has that has two <laughs> prongs coming out the back. Yeah, it's inserted into the anus, Ooh. and then the two prongs are electrified, and it sends an electric shock. Yeah. into the taint, which then causes the bull to get massive erection and shoot. Fuck yeah! So. If you think the fleshlight is where it's going, I'm telling you, it's got ways to go. No, I like your ideas. Pretty soon, you're going to be butt-fucking a probe. See, I thought we Pretty re- soon. <laughs> I thought... Like today. <laughs> yeah. I'm su- pretty soon it indicates it hadn't already happened. <laughs> the way things are going, they'd soon put AI in these things so it could anticipate the man's needs. Oh. Eventually, these things, uh, to conserve energy, just run on semen. Eventually, these <laughs> things become sentient, refuse to shut off, and make and use us. It's like a oh. matrix, but only oh, men are okay. harvested. It just oh, just totally. using our semen in those pods over and over yeah. again. But this, most dudes were pretty cool with it. Yeah, they, it was totally <laughs> like all right. South Park shake. They didn't even come up with like the matrix where you were your mind was in a different place. You were in that pod just getting jerked off by the yeah. machine, and you were totally fine. Totally fine with it. Yeah, the AI talked. It sounded sexy. This is the future. I'm on board. <laughs> in response to last week, I actually dressed my podium up to look like a juvenile grizzly bear. <laughs> And then you blew it? That's not the no, same. No, it blew me. It was <laughs> Wow, that article about bear blowing really yeah. got you. You did something about it. <laughs> That's right. 
Question number three, how long before this type of machine is integrated into our everyday life? Like we talked about, you know, maybe it'll be in a bar or something like that, but they'll take it out of this, the podium model, and they'll build it into to regular podiums or to car seats or to the first class section of airplanes. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yes. You know, <laughs> you know it's arrived when uh, there are custom things that, you know, you, you could walk into a shop to get, a, to get your thing customized to look like uh, yeah. whatever you wanted. A young grizzly, like yeah, okay. pimp my ride, <laughs> pimp my podium, pimp my Miley podium. Cyrus, uh, yeah, Robert I think it, Timothy. You know what's funny is we are kind of limited to human sexual representations these days because we think of humans when we have sex and that becomes part of our sexual fantasies. But when you divorce it so or much, bats. yeah, or bats, <laughs> or bats, when you divorce it so much from like the biology of it, it just becomes this machine that does it. I wonder what people will look on. It does have a little screen, but I wonder if people are just going to start jerking off or, or having the thing jerk them off. While they look at like yachts or cars, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> the future is a wonderful place. Yeah, so many options in the future. And also, you ladies have had a monopoly on sex toys forever. We've had to settle for our That's hand. True. We didn't. You, uh, this is leveling the playing field. You know what? Here's why I'm not even upset about this. You mentioned it being first class in airplanes. There are so many times where it would be so nice to not have to give that hand job on an airplane just to not have to go through the motions of like you know can i have a blanket flight attendant and then you know like <laughs> oh we should put your tray table down and you know like it would just save car i mean carpal tunnel will go down dramatically in women absolutely you know what? next time i sit next to a female stranger i'm gonna and she acts like i'm the asshole i'm gonna claim <laughs> listen Jackie gives hand jobs american- to strangers on planes american rules okay before we cross international waters that's right Question number four. I started thinking about this more and more. Is it really the women that are going to be made obsolete by this? I actually think, no, I think it's the men. Hear me out. If you allowed your average 19-year-old male access to one of these machines, if you gave it to 25 19-year-old men across the United States, within three years, you'd have enough semen to keep the human race going for the next 4,000 years. Like that, that's just, a, can we choose? Women? That is a fact. I did, I did the you calculations. <laughs> okay. So the, that would mean there would never be a semen shortage again, basically for, for the, for entire history. Has there, has there ever been a semen shortage? Yes. Can we, when was that? My girlfriend's face last night. I solved it though. Um, <laughs> so for F. I did that to myself. <laughs> but th- there would never be a semen shortage again. And we could collect enough semen for endless generations of children, which would mean women wouldn't need men around anymore to procreate and keep civilization going, which would mean they'll probably get together sometime soon and just kill us all in our sleep to take over society. It's most likely. When that happens, Jackie, what will your role be in the new female-based society? Um, I like the sound of king female. No way. You could you yeah. would get bitched out by so many other women. You could Heisenberg them. She's a scientist. There's... Yeah. You could take over science faction completely. It would just be you, and you would be the science promoter in this new female world. Hmm. And, like while, and while you would be a highly emotional and irrational male, you are actually a very uh, rational and unemotional female. Yeah. This might I pride give myself you a, on this. A big advantage. I think so. Honestly, I don't. I wouldn't want to be a leader per se. I enjoy leading, but you know, it's a lot of responsibility. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's right. So I think I think it'd be this sort of group project. Basically, we'd all just you're share gonna... the A. You know, we'd all just pass around the. Are you hinting at the fact that you're just going to be the head of a biker dyke gang? Like, ooh, I like that. All right, let's move on to tell me a story. Tell me a science story. They're like children's stories, only with less sex and more science. All right, guys, I put together what I think is a pretty interesting story because it's a topic that I find super interesting, which is our old ancestors, the Neanderthals. We got some some new and very compelling research coming out about them. I want to start out with a brief history of Neanderthals, if you guys aren't familiar with them. About a million and a half years ago to um, just over a million years ago, we had these things running around, these hominids called Homo erectus or Homo ergaster. Just a bunch of homos. Just a bunch of homos. They look they looked like us from the neck down, basically. They were a little bit taller than we are, but they were upright. They had fire. They had stone tools. They had sharpened wood tools. And they ran around with smaller brains than us, about halfway between chimps and us, just demolishing everything. They were the first ones to really leave Africa, Homo erectus or Gaster. They went out into Asia. They went to the Middle East. They went to Europe. Uh, they explored the Indonesian islands. They, they went a lot of different places, and they were very efficient hunters. They were a very successful species around for more than a million years. 
and then they basically slowly evolved in northern Africa, Europe region into what we call Homo heidelbergensis or Homo antecessor. And that species eventually became Neanderthals about 600,000 around there years ago, uh, or, or became the branch that would become Neanderthals in Europe. In Africa, that same species basically became human. So if you think of what Neanderthals are, it's almost like a, a brother species to us, or you could call it a cousin species, like... Uh, the species that like cousin, brother second from... cousin like if i fuck it am i going to get in trouble no because it turns out we did that so <gasps> yeah us and neanderthals both came from basically the same parent species or maybe a very similar parent species we just evolved in different regions the neanderthals evolved in europe we evolved in africa then the neanderthals live in europe for a long time they're fairly successful there though very small populations they live there from wherever you want to say their evolution line is 600,000 years ago someplace around there all the way up into meeting modern humans when modern humans worked their way into Europe 30 to 40,000 years ago, and they interbreed with them. So we know from genetic evidence that almost all non-Africans have some Neanderthal DNA, which puts them back into our line. So they, they would be like a cousin or a brother species, but because we interbred with them, they actually do share some genetic history with us. How much consent was involved in those couplings? In I have to imagine none. Because like if you look... <laughs> At what a Neanderthal looks like, they don't look so great. So here, here are kind of the differences Is it between like the Neander clubbing and dragging the woman by the hair. Is yeah, that where that comes from? they're also yeah. the burliest dude. That's basically it. So if you want to think in your head, what what is a Neanderthal? What's the difference between a Neanderthal and a Homo sapien? Neanderthals are shorter, squatter. They got thicker bones, barrel chested, shorter limbs. These are all great adaptations for the cold. These people lived in the cold for a long time, and much like the Inuit uh, modern Homo sapiens an easy way to deal with cold is to shrink limb length and expand body mass because mm -hmm. you can keep in heat that way. And so they had bodies that were very much geared towards that. Their faces and skulls were a little bit different. They had a pronounced brow ridge. They had a little bit of elongated head with a larger brain case, though there does not seem to indicate that that meant higher intelligence because culturally when it turns to their tools and their hunting techniques, they are almost always behind Homo sapien. So larger they're brain... also there in the cold. But the Homo sapien went up to the cold, too. And when they're in the same place, they, they do things okay. very differently. We wore jackets. That's we didn't evolve. <laughs> well, everybody wore jackets. The and North Face evolved was, very early. Tr trust me, Ice Age Europe was not a warm place. Everybody wore jackets. They were like the penguins. They all just huddled up and yeah. males carried children on their feet for oh, 20 years. So cute. They had incredibly small populations. Some people think that across all of Europe and the Middle East, there were only somewhere between ten to 15,000 Neanderthals at any given time. So very, very small populations, but they were able to keep going for a long time, and a lot of them stayed very genetically isolated. Well, this new research comes from the probably the most famous Neanderthal site called Cima de los Huesos, which is in Spain. It is a chimney cave, which is basically a long drop that's about 40 feet or about 13 meters down, and these creatures walk around about 400,000 years ago, fell in. These were in the clade of Neanderthals, they were related to them. They are probably not the direct ancestors of most of the Neanderthals we see, but they're overall show, show Neanderthal characteristics. So 400,000 years ago, this is before Homo sapiens made it to Europe. These are still pretty much just Neanderthals. And what do we see in them? Well, we see that they do have a lot of differences in the facial muscles and the, facial, uh, and, and the face in general. One of the mysteries of Neanderthals has always been they did not diverge from human beings very long ago. They were very, very recently diverged from human beings, but they are very different. They look very different than almost all other hominids. Their skull structure, their face structure, their body. We were curious as to how this evolution happened so quickly and what order Ancient it happened. Aliens. Yeah, it was almost certainly aliens. <laughs> certainly. So when we look at these bones, which are 400,000 years old, as Neanderthals are differentiating, we see some of the characteristics we see in later Neanderthals, but not all of them. And the ones that are most prominent have to do with facial muscles and using the teeth. One other weird thing about Neanderthal bones, their teeth. So the dorsal side of their bottom incisors, so the outside part of the front four teeth that you have in your mouth, the outside part of that is all worn down. As oh, I thought you were going to say diamonds, like they have the grill. Just grilled out bling. <laughs> and what we found is that Neanderthals throughout time, and including all the way back here 400,000 years ago, are using their mouth almost like an extra hand. Like they're nonstop using their mouth <laughs> in such a way that they develop... Different jaw structures, different types of things. Well, they didn't have the podium back then. No, they didn't. <laughs> that's yeah, that's exactly right. Where I was they had, going. 
<laughs> they had to get really good with the mouth. Knock some teeth out on occasion. And... Yeah. <laughs> and there's a really interesting theory coming from some of these bones that maybe one of the things that pushed this Neanderthal evolution so fast and so far was this use of the mouth like a, like a third hand that we see throughout Neanderthal history. And it would be interesting because this would be a huge example of culture, i.e. using your mouth like a hand, pushing evolution or pushing the biology. And, and one that has a huge impact on the history of mankind. Do you have an example of, of when you... Use your mouth as a hand. Well, <laughs> it's a Friday night, eleven o'clock. You, you had a date night. You kind of tired, but you got to keep the relationship going. You're willing to make a sacrifice. You're out of toilet paper. Oh God! <laughs> I'm sorry, I asked. So this this collection involves a minimum of 28 different hominids, different uh, ne- pre Neanderthals or Neanderthals, with over 7,000 individual fossils. So huge amount of data. This is the largest Neanderthal site we have by far. It also gives us a good glimpse of a bunch of different Neanderthals within one time period. And this is a very interesting part of human evolutionary history and human evolutionary study. What caused Neanderthals to be the way they were? Maybe it was this cultural practice. Regardless of whether it was this or not, we do see that evidence of it is prevalent throughout Neanderthal history and at the very, very beginning of it. I always like these stories about ancient hominids because you have to wonder what makes them different than us. You know, there was a time not that long ago when there was five or six advanced hominid species on the earth. There was us. There was Neanderthals. There was the remnants of Homo erectus. There was Homo floresiensis in Indonesia. You know, you had all these different groups running around. Why is it that we survived? Mm -hmm. Why is it that we were the ones that came out on top with maybe a little Neanderthal DNA? What was the differences? And at least in this case... One of the differences was a cultural one that seemed to drive biology. And maybe our own cultural differences drive biology. Maybe our use of language, we start developing language, and then the ones who have the brain structure that are better for language survive, and they move on, and so on. So our history might be a little bit of biology driven by culture, which is always a very cool thing. That was the story. Oh. No fun questions? Well, here's a fun question. If you could go back in time and talk to these ancient Neanderthals, and give them one piece of advice that might help them survive longer than they did after meeting Homo sapiens, what would that piece of advice be? Watch Dr. Oz. (laughs) That's how you'll beat them. (laughs) Learn their weaknesses. Follow the stupidest among them and exploit it. First off, it's important that your genes survive. All right? So just you're going to have to interbreed with these people. Also, I know that I'm a male, but if you're going to choose one, please rape me instead of kill me. (laughs) You're a very strong individual. Thank you for listening this far. <laughs> yes. You're clearly wise beyond your years Listen, for your people. I, I know that it's not going to be impressive based on my facial structure, but I can try and use my mouth like a hand. I, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to wow you like your own people would. Yeah. Listen, uh, from my time, if you would have thought, told me a year from now, I would be blowing a Neanderthal who's never heard the concept of bathing. I just said you were crazy. Yeah. And you've been reading my fantasy journal. <laughs> All right, on to the lightning round. Yes. Yes. Question number one. (laughs) What have humans been doing for 3,000 years? Reverse cowgirl. (laughs) I feel like that might be older. They had you to research. So? I don't yeah. know. I feel like. Uh, you well, know. you mean it's a. It's 3,000 a, years is a long time. No, no, no. It's a progression. You had to. You Like, cultures had to develop advanced horse riding skills. And then oh. the idea, you right. know, what if we applied this to fucking? Exactly. That's, I just feel like lazy dudes figured that out a long time ago where they would, like, a lazy ruler would randomly point at one of his harem and be like, you. Yeah, but that is sure for a girl on top. But we're yeah. talking about what if reverse. Hap- well, what about the ugly ones? Very inventive. He would point um, at them, and then they would just flip around. Just put like a feed bag over her head. Yeah. What, if, what if it happened the other way around? Like one day a king was like, you know what? Hey, harem girl, get over here. All right, now face this way when you sit on me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's like, you know what? What if we did this to those horses that are all out there? What if we, what if we rode them? You know what I, <laughs> I heard happened them. is he was doing the reverse cowgirl a long time ago. And then he ended up standing up and like seeing that position, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, what should I call this?" And then he thought, "I should invent something called a wheelbarrow that I could use to carry things in a similar fashion that I'm having sex with this woman in." Yeah. <laughs> and then that's how the wheelbarrow position came about. Yeah. And the wheelbarrow. And the wheelbarrows. Damien, what do you think humans have been doing for three thousand years? Well, not all cultures, but certainly the Chinese, because they invent everything, but have been rubbing our genitals on bats. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Look at that, full circle. You know what's interesting? He came kind of close, because it did happen in China. Woo! 
no like, kidding. No like kidding. everything. <laughs> Humans have been drastically altering the environment and the landscape around them. 3,000 years ago with the damning... And the bat population. Yeah. The damming and managing of the Yellow River in China, which is basically the hub of civilization there. I know. It's a it's horrible... It's a racist thing. river. Uh, <laughs> oh, I was going a different way. I was like, I don't want to be drinking out of what's called the Yellow River. Yeah. I feel like that's just a bunch of people peeing. In their language, is it Coke? Is it the Coke yeah. River? And so... <laughs> They altered it so much, in fact, that they caused flooding and they caused droughts and they caused everything else. So they've actually been essentially geoengineering the planet for about 3,000 years now. And current research suggests that they're doing that actually significantly changed the environment in that area of China for the past 3,000 years. Also, don't drink downstream from the Yellow River. <laughs> Question number two. What does current research suggest may actually be good for people? Smoking. Oh, I like this. Yeah, you get thin. You're better able to attack the day. Yeah, you get that little buzz. Even better, you don't have to worry about retirement. Who's going to need to worry about you know all the paperwork and the money and retirement? Fuck, no, I'm dying at 58. That's right. Okay. No cancer. Well, well except no. from the smoking. Yeah, the cancer will cause <laughs> well, the smoking. Isn't being obese, like in the long run, more unhealthy? That, so if, if smoking... No, smoking's more unhealthy, but still. Okay, Damien, what do you think? current research suggests is actually good for people well aside from ignoring dr oz yeah current research suggests that in order to help america and science americans across the country need to write facebook about the injustice that has been done to our podcast that's right because <laughs> if you're listening right now this message is not just falling on deaf ears insurgents. <laughs> that's right if you're listening right now go on our facebook page and just write in the comment section just write science is badass we're, we're gonna we're gonna yeah. fuck with facebook as much as possible yes okay uh the actual reason casual sex all right. Casual sex is actually good for you. Uh, Thank interesting. God. I know. Really took a <laughs> lot off your shoulders. Yeah. Interesting research uh, by a researcher who had actually previously come out with a study about how casual sex can be bad for men and can have negative health effects. This one was done on college students, as they tend to be done, and it focused on the reasoning <laughs> sex in for sex. And what this researcher was able to do is pull out the the fact that before when she had looked at college students who had participated in casual sex, she found a general negative tendency in their lives. What she did is this time she segregated it out for the reasons they were having sex, whether it was for mm. fun, enjoyment, or sexual exploration. Or for emotional attachment and then neediness. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> because of terrible fathers. So if you're doing it for fun or sexual exploration or anything like that, she supposedly calls those autonomous reasons or reasons you would just normally go after and have sex. And she said when people have sex for those reasons, in the end, there's no difference in their health. And so it's basically a neutral thing, which they say is beneficial. And I think that just means because... Hey, we're having sex. This is great. <laughs> but basically it has no negative effects. If you have sex for non-autonomous reasons, and I like some of the reasons they gave, uh, revenge. <laughs> revenge. Or while too intoxicated or to avoid unpleasant feelings. Or, to spread AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> Which could be revenge. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're a flight attendant. This is a Canadian <laughs> flight attendant. <laughs> Or being tricked into it. I like that one, too. <laughs> being uh, tricked into it? All of those produce the non-autonomous reasons. All those produce negative effects. So if you're, not, if you're having the autonomous sex, it seems like there are no negative effects. Maybe some positive ones. If you're having the non-autonomous ones, there are definitely negative effects. So I should go home and tell my wife, listen, sweetie, this form of sexual slavery yeah. you have me in, that you, right. that, you, that you have my penis in shackles... That's unhealthy for me. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you need to realize that what you're doing is having a non-beneficial effect on my health. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we then, need to cut the revenge spreading of AIDS down. No, and then she Half. tricks him into fucking. <laughs> and he's like, no, don't give me the yellow river on my face. No. <laughs> Use your mouth, not your hands. <laughs> you're gonna, it's a, it's, you know, as bad as it is, it's worse when you're done. Because at least if you have an erection, you can kind of like maybe fight through it. But yeah. like, like once you're finished and then she does it, it's kind of just like her marked territory. <laughs> Or revenge, either way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do like the idea of sex for revenge. Remember you know what? I know women who've done that. Really? Yeah, it's like... Like, it... that dude stole my parking spot? I better give him some pussy? Like, that doesn't no. seem like... I don't think you guys no. have figured out revenge. No, like, the guy <laughs> I'm sleeping with... I'm not going to call him back. <laughs> That'll show him. <laughs> you know what? He just parked in my parking spot? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip a 20 under his windshield wipers. <laughs> no, like... I feigned emotional attachment, but there wasn't any. That'll show him. <laughs> No. Let's see how well my mouth works. No, like getting back at an ex-boyfriend by sleeping with his friend. Oh. Eh. 
<laughs> I'm just saying that's that's revenge. you know in the it, I didn't realize that or that was a real brother. I didn't realize that was a real thing. But as a guy, if that had happened to me, in my mind, I'd be like. Well, that's not great, but general karma-wise, I didn't realize there was an option for me to be fucking all my friends' ex-girlfriends. <laughs> I need to start capitalizing. <laughs> Every guy, when their buddy, brother, cousin, whatever, starts dating an insane, irrational lady, uh, some part of your mind, you're like, maybe. Maybe this will turn into that's something. Right. <laughs> Jackpot. So, for those of you who are out there having sex with multiple partners, but are doing it for the right reasons, and of course doing it protected, that could actually be a healthy thing for you, and so on top of writing Facebook, if you guys would all like to contact my girlfriend and make sure she's aware of that research, that would be great as well. <laughs> hey, you do you. That's right. Or, you know, whoever. Yeah. Or just r random chicks. <laughs> Question number three. What substance did we just now discover Byzantine painters in Cyprus use in their plaster to give it an extra shine? Female ejaculate. <laughs> First of all, a myth, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sure. <laughs> Sure. So they would actually, they would get a girl. Cypress, an island of squirters. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best the tourist campaign they ever yeah, had. Yeah, the travel agency. You know what? I'm, maybe really you yeah, I'm interested. Maybe you go to Cyprus, Bobby. That's yeah. That's, <laughs> I think we actually, I, from my Google Analytics, we do have like one listener in Cyprus. So if it's really? true, please give me a buzz. Oh, yeah. So, Damien, what do you think we, we just now discovered Byzantine painters used in Cyprus to give their plaster an extra shine? Well, if female ejaculate's off the table, I got to go to my go-to Shetland pony. Okay, <laughs> just pony it, it's or Shetland semen? pony semen. Okay, oh, it's, I see. it's what I've been tell, putting on my pamphlets. <laughs> Byzantine painters used it to in, to keep cancer out of their paintings. Oh, I see. <laughs> and give them a shine. Yeah. <laughs> Shiny, All right, like... cancer-free Byzantine paintings. Well, technically, a hundred percent of Byzantine paintings are cancer-free, yeah. so you might be on to something. There, there are a lot of cultures that can't say that yeah. as quickly as you just did. That's true, <laughs> just because they have a slower language. Right. The actual answer is asbestos. Asbestos. It turns out that they mixed that with the plaster, and it gives it a very shiny surface. Asbestos had been used for certain heat-resistant properties for a long time, but we thought it had not been added to plaster for this reason until all the way into the Industrial Revolution. So to figure out that this was going on, you know, 800, 900 years ago on this one island in Cyprus, it got discovered, they figured it out, and then all of a sudden that was lost to history for over half a millennium. That's kind of one of those very cool and interesting historical mysteries. Jackie, I believe you were mistaken. Uh -huh. um, female ejaculate was used for the Roman fire. Oh, uh, that is right. I do mix those up. So that leads us at the end of the lightning round, and I must... <laughs> I must say that because of his closeness and guessing the first one about China, I'm going to have to give that one to Damien. That That's was fair. pretty That's fair. Pretty good Very lightning intuitive. Round. That is the end of our lightning round. Let's move it on to finish my story. Finish my story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, gentlemen. What are we at now? 5-5, five, five, We're tied we're at 5-5. Tied at 5-5. Five, five. Five, five. And by the way, fans, we still need some audience interaction. What Yeah. What Put it on our Facebook and call it Badass Retribution. Yeah. What happens to the person who loses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Has to go to Mark Zuckerberg's house and physically yeah. threaten him. Kiss him. I, you know what? I, I kind of have the feeling you can't just knock on his door. Like, I feel like there's, there's some middlemen. Huh. <laughs> Maybe they'll pass on the threat. Can you tell Zuckerberg that I'm going to punch him in the neck? Why don't I've, we send him a poke? I have a uh, picture of me punching an effigy of Mr. Zuckerberg, <laughs> if you could please. For Kindly this. deliver. All right. Why do you guys think Paula Dean's words might have a greater impact on our brains than, say, Hillary Clinton or Maya Angelou? Mm, I would guess because men only listen to women who feed us mm. and who hate black people. Okay. I like how you took it and just made the world all men. That was yeah. nice. Like, wait, wait. There's... Oh, like little boys, too. Sorry. I didn't think about boys as uh -huh. well. Yeah. Good recovery. <laughs> what about you, Damien? Why do you think Paula Deen's words might have a greater impact on our brains? Men and women's brains. <laughs> oh, women! That's right, women. You know, Bobby, you love and respect women. So I you, love and respect. I, you problem, need to remember their people. Here's the problem: <laughs> I love and respect women so much that I relate to them on a one-to-one -one basis, and I don't think about myself. Uh -huh. You don't even I'm, see I'm gender. Selfless, yeah. God. So I'm thinking about men because I think of men as different from me. Uh -huh. Would it surprise you if I told you that I'm a male? Since you don't see that, I, it would amaze me. I didn't know the difference. Between you guys, though you are standing in front of that Chinese podium a lot, so I guess that probably should have tipped me off. <laughs> Why might Paula Dean's words have a greater impact on our brains than Hillary Clinton or Maya Angelou? 
Because as offensive as Miss Dean's comments were, they're nothing compared to the things Andrew Lou and Clinton have said. <laughs> In terms of racism? Racism, homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism. Oh, okay. My Angelou, if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, was one of the founding members of the Southern Nazi Party. Yeah, oh. no, I think you're right on that one. Oh, I believe okay. I saw that on her Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. You learn so much about a person after they pass, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All the skeletons come out of the closet. Oh, her her under her private notes will be published soon, and you'll racy. Yeah. The truth is, researchers at Princeton University have published a study in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience that indicates that taste metaphors emotionally engage our brains more than regular metaphors. So in this study, participants read 37 sentences that included common metaphors based on taste while the researchers recorded their brain activity. Each taste-related word was then swapped with a literal counterpart. So for instance, she looked at him sweetly became she looked at him kindly. The researchers found that the sentences containing words that invoked taste activated areas known to be associated with emotional processing, such as the amygdala, as well as the areas known as the gustatory cortices that allow for the physical act of tasting. So even just saying a word that relates to taste activates part of your brain that thinks you're about to taste something. Interestingly, the metaphorical and literal words only resulted in brain activity related to emotion when used as part of a sentence, but stimulated the gustatory cortices both in sentences and as standalone words. Interesting. Yeah. So that's interesting. The words themselves have a different impact on the brain and how we're monitoring it. And what we hear different, because we associate it with food, mm -hmm. we activate a different part of the brain. Right. So the, so the researchers um, think that metaphorical sentences using taste may spark increased brain activity in emotion-related regions because they allude to a physical experience. Hmm. So it's not nebulous But so do, like so do non-food things. So if I were to describe something that had to do with sports, if I used like Or a, sex. Yeah, anything like that, would those work the same? They only tried the taste-related metaphors in this study, but they explain it as we come up with words to describe things without limit, you know, like time or love, you know, and the words that we use to describe them, we've come up with to describe them, but... When you have sweet or bitter or something like that where you can physically taste it in your mouth or activate the part of your brain that senses that sensation mm -hmm. or makes that sensation, then it is more emotional to us because we can relate to it more directly. And see, I would just wonder if the word like painful had the same effect because painful is a physical feeling as well, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you use that painful, would the part of your brain that actually feels pain go? Or is it that we hear that word so much and have such a nebulous connotation of it that it doesn't? You have yeah, to you know. have to get more descriptive, like testicle crushingly yeah. uh, bad. Yeah, because that, I can, get very uh, that specific. puts a picture in my head That's right. of elementary school. Well, uh, let's see. I'm pretty torn here. Go with your heart. Okay, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go with the other organ that you're going to decide with right before that. Go with your gallbladder. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> He's picked the organ. I, need... <laughs> I produce bile. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks for coming in and tuning in for another Science Faction. That was Science Faction 25. Come on back for Science Faction 26, but not before yelling at those people on Facebook because, once again, science is badass. Help me milk this Shetland. We're going to send it to Zuckerberg. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>